When it comes to music, maestro Leonard Slatkin knows the score. There are only two kinds of music, good music and the other stuff. He has led orchestras all over the globe, but for almost 30 years, Slatkin was associated with the St. Louis Symphony, serving as music director from 1979 until he left to lead the National Symphony in 1996. Here in the nation's heartland, right in the middle of the country, we became an important orchestra, in particular for our promotion of the music of this country. I hated to leave, but after all that time, I would have been put into maintenance mode. And I'm not a maintenance person. I'm about trying to find new ideas. And many of those new ideas can be found in his new book, Classical Crossroads, available at Left Bank Books. His thoughts are especially timely now because of the effect of COVID on the arts. I think we are going to see a big sea change in how our audiences are. So we have to adjust programming. We have to adjust the way we present the concerts. We have to make the difference between the live event in person radically different from what you can get with all these streaming events that we've been able to see. One, two, three. As in his two previous books, Slatkin makes the complexities of music easy to understand and easy to take, thanks to his irreverent sense of humor. Which piece would you be perfectly happy never having to conduct again? 1812 Overture. I do not need to do this piece again. The Pachelbel Canon. I had to record this piece. I hate this piece. I really don't like it. Really? Yes, I can't stand I love it. it. It goes on and on doing the same thing. You know, I, I was just happy that none of my marriages had to use this as music. Maybe for divorces it would be good. That might be nice. Leonard Slatkin, thanks very much for joining. It's great to have you with us here. Very nice to be with you. I think people may not realize, I'm not sure that I did until I read the book, that you are not only from Hollywood, so to speak, but not just geographically, but really of Hollywood because of your parents. Amazing. I'm a studio brat. My father was the concertmaster of the orchestra at 20th Century Fox. My mother was the first cellist at Warner Brothers, and her brother, Victor, was the pianist at Warner's. So if you've seen films from about the late 30s to about 1956 from those studios, you've heard my parents. You've heard them all the time. My dad stopped playing in the studios in the late 50s, concentrating on conducting and arranging. My mom, though, continued to play for a while and was made somewhat infamous by a certain gentleman who gave her two notes to play for a film score. And those two notes went like this. And John Williams always refers to my mother as the original Jaws. Wow. How did she take that? Oh, very well. And John will tell audiences that story. And if I happen to be in the crowd, he'll say, Mrs. Slatkin was scaring audiences ever since that film came out. And I'd say, John, you're wrong. She was scaring people long before that. When I was given the book and started to read through it, I was like, this seems like a book, just looking at the chapter headings, that maybe is written for professional musicians to read, sort of an inside baseball kind of thing. But as I started to read it, and I'm completely a dilettante when it comes to classical music, I was fascinated by it about how to conduct and unions and dealing with all of that sort of stuff that in a way has nothing to do with anything that anybody in the audience would need to know, but it's all really interesting. Who were you writing the book for? It is generally, as all my other books have been, for a general audience who at least have some passing interest in music. You don't have to be able to read music, you don't have to play an instrument, but it helps to know just a little bit about what music is, but it doesn't matter the kind of music. It goes back to what Duke Ellington and others have said. There are only two kinds of music, good music and the other stuff. So what I tried to do in this book is to outline 
some of the differences with how classical music, for want of a better term, we still have not come up with the right term for this kind of music. <laughs> classical music literally would mean from a particular period in history. Uh, to most people, though, it means something else entirely. Uh, anyway, we don't know what else to call it. So the idea is for people who have some interest in it, what does an orchestra do? What does the conductor do? What's the relationship with the people writing the music? What restrictions do we have? And the idea was that the 20th century and the 21st century have seen a huge change in what's occurred in my part of the music industry. And I wanted to point those out so that people would really understand what's different, why it's different, and possible solutions for things that I think are difficult. Everything changed for the book as I was writing it when the pandemic hit. Is it potentially an existential threat to not just classical music, but all sorts of live performances? Well, of course it is. People are afraid to go to live events in many cases. There are really big questions about who we allow into the events. What about our performers on stage? Do they represent a danger to each other? How do artists get from one country to the next? Travel has been made impossible in many cases. That's limited the way we can present our programs. But some places have managed to adapt by the use of clever video and audio technologies. But will that supplant the live performances? I think we are going to see a big sea change in how our audiences are. So we have to adjust programming. We have to adjust the way we present the concerts. We have to make the difference between the live event in person radically different from what you can get with all these streaming events that we've been able to see. Clearly something is missing, but it needs to be made more different, separating the live art from the recorded or televised event. Well, let's hope for better days. We do. I try to remain cautiously pessimistic, <laughs> but I still think it'll probably turn out okay. But between all of the issues that have come together at once, we haven't seen a lot about this. It's not been just the pandemic. You had Black Lives Matter, you had woke movements, you had all the other things that society is going through, all converging at the same time. And of course, they're going to impact the arts, because the arts thrive on what society is to create its own art. What will come of all this? We don't know, it's too soon to say. But groups are trying to figure it out. We'll have to see what happens. In the book, uh, you render any number of strong opinions about things. One is the audition process, and I know you feel particularly strong about that because I think you wrote about it about three different times oh. in the book. For folks who don't know how symphony auditions are generally conducted now, explain that and then some of your, your qualms with that. The first thing to know is that we have about 1,500 orchestras in this country, which all have to be entered by the world of audition. Auditions are announced in union paper, word of mouth, but there is a legal process to which you apply. Now we jump ahead a little bit to, let, let's say, the top 50 orchestras, just to throw it out there. The first round of auditions, people can submit a recording. And a committee, that usually does not involve the music director, listens, and they kind of decide who goes through. But no one knows who is on the recording. We don't have bios. No information, it's just purely based on what you hear. So it could actually be maybe not the person who they suspect. <laughs> we, we don't know. So the, then there's a live audition. And now comes the tricky part. In the 1970s, a timpanist in San Francisco who'd been in the orchestra for a year was not granted tenure. And she sued the San Francisco Symphony because she claimed racial bias. She was black, her name was Elaine Jones. She lost the lawsuit, but she did start something that was very important for the time, and that was that auditions should be done behind a screen, so nobody could see gender, race, 
color, whatever it was. There were also carpeting put down so you couldn't hear heels if they happened to wear heels. There was no communication. The committee listening, again, without the music director, had no idea who was playing. And we all understood why this had to be that way at that time. It did produce significant results. The number of females entering the orchestral workforce increased dramatically. But we now saw ourselves confronted with a new problem, especially in the 21st century, and especially in this time when organizations are trying for diversity. So how can you achieve diversity if you can't know if the people playing for you are diverse or not? How do we solve this? So my solution, it's one way. A lot of musicians are going to disagree. I think you do the screens for the first round because then you go through semifinals, then you have finals. If somebody's proven themselves behind the screen after one round and are technically good enough, then the screen comes down. Then we find out who they are. And one of the reasons to me that I think it's critical is that the screen also presents a barrier. Music is about communication. And yet here's this blank wall. Nobody can see anybody. Nobody can talk to anybody. We're literally going against what our profession is supposed to do. If I wanted to say to somebody, uh, do you mind playing that maybe a little faster or a little softer? Or why are you doing it this way? I can't do that. Nobody on the committee can do that. We don't know. But more importantly, you have a lot of young incredibly gifted musicians coming from all over the world. Supposing you're an experienced musician, you want to change orchestras after 25 years. Maybe you want to be closer to where your family is. Maybe you want just a change of scenery. Shouldn't experience have something to do with it? Wouldn't I want to see on a resume that this person played in the St. Louis Symphony, New York Philharmonic, whatever it was? Who did they study with? These are things that I think will promulgate growth. Every orchestra now is just loaded with these young people, and all they do is congregate mostly with other young people. So this idea of experience is beginning to fade away. So I think the screen needs to be lowered, at least in the final rounds. In fact, I think the finals themselves shouldn't be a straight out audition like we used to. Finals come down to three or four people, put each of them in the orchestra for four weeks. You can tell in four weeks if they're good enough to be in the orchestra. Part of the, I guess you could call it, minutia that you get into in the book that you would think maybe wouldn't be that interesting, but really is to the audience, at least it was to me, is uh, where you're talking about tyranny of the clock, so to speak, my phrase, not yours, with regard, because of the unions, with regard to how, having to be aware of how long a concert is going and how long a piece is going. That was really fascinating. Well, this is something nobody thinks about who is not on the stage. There are really rigorous rules about, obviously, how long rehearsals can be, the breaks during the rehearsal, what order you can rehearse the pieces in. But at a concert, there are also rules about how long the performance can take. And the problem we have here is really filtering down now into the 21st century. And it's going to be a little different with different orchestras, but generally the allowable performance time is two hours and 15 minutes, which is usually more than enough. Usually a concert is over in two hours, sometimes less. But what happens when you're on tour and the sponsor comes out? welcomes everybody, makes a speech, here's what's coming up next week. The soloist plays and then plays maybe a seven minute encore. And then you get after your mission and some of the audience aren't back so you can't quite start the second half. And then you decided, maybe I'm gonna take some tempo slower. And now you're perilously close to that two hours and 15 minutes. You go off stage and rather than people telling you how wonderful it is, they'll say, you know, you're going to have to get the orchestra off stage in the next minute, or I was going to have to pay overtime. And yet your audience is applauding vociferously. They want more from you. So who gets penalized here? The audience. I think a concert ends when the audience tells you it's over. We've finished our job. We've played the concert. 
but now it's time for people to show their appreciation and for us to accept that. So I would love to see that end limit. You can say performance, the actual playing of music has to end at the two hour, 15 minute mark. But anything past that, that's in control of the audience as it should be, I think. Have you ever found yourself in a time crunch and you've increased the tempo of well, the actually, last movement? As we're talking, I did find that uh, just a few weeks ago from when we're speaking, I was at the Aspen Festival and with COVID restrictions, they had to keep the concert to 90 minutes. I got to the rehearsals and was told we're going to do this program without an intermission, which is why the 90 minutes came in. It would have been longer if we had an intermission. And now I had to take out what we call a repeated segment in the fifth Beethoven symphony. That means there was a chunk of music, which is possible to do, and a lot of people do eliminate that, but I don't, but now I had to. So I had to make a musical compromise just because the restriction said, you can't do the repeat Beethoven wrote. Something not right there. This is a thoroughly unoriginal question that I admit I'm stealing from Susan Stanberg from NPR. Oh, yes. uh, you may even know the question because it was sort of famous when she asked. I think she asked it of George Schulte, but I can't swear by that. But she asked him, do your arms get tired when you're conducting? My arms get tired. My brain gets more tired. The physical act of conducting is one that never occurs to us while we're actually conducting. Some of us do stretching exercises. Some of us do strengthening exercises. More than the arms, the back is what tends to suffer. And eventually we wind up conducting from stools or chairs. But sore arms, if we've done our job properly, it's a good thing. We should always have a little bit of that because if you're holding a stick, already there's some tension that goes through here. And then if you're doing this and the music is taut like that, tension goes up through here and then it starts to go up in the shoulders and you know, we have all kinds of physical ailments so the answer is yeah it gets tired but the adrenaline that never stops it keeps us going well and I think the answer that she got when she asked him was only if it's going badly my <laughs> arms get tired <laughs> and then you can't go fast enough that's right to get through it I've had a couple concerts like that in my life where I thought something isn't right here actually one of them happened in St. Louis it was just was a performance that started and something just didn't feel right. It wasn't, I don't know, I just thought this is not going so well. It's nothing wrong, but nothing's happening. So only after it was over did I learn that at intermission, the orchestra had had a meeting and they had taken a vote to go on strike and then they had to walk on stage and try to play. So we were all struggling, but I didn't know that at the time. Not that I could have done anything about it. You spent almost 30 years in St. Louis conducting. Uh, what were some of the highlights of that time? St. Louis was home for many reasons. My grandfather on my father's side settled here at the early part of the 20th century. My father was born here and was the assistant concertmaster of the orchestra. I was here for, as you pointed out, almost 30 years. My son was born here, so there are four generations of Slatkins. I had a lot to do when I got here. The first thing, literally the first thing for me, was to create a youth orchestra. We didn't have one. Most cities of this size have a place where the young musician can go and play alongside people they've never met, never seen. They come from all over. I'm so proud that this organization not only just exists now, but it thrives. It's providing musicians for other orchestras all over the country. It has given so many young people an active start into the world of the arts. I would have hoped and liked that maybe it could have sparked a little more interest in the idea of arts education in our public schools, but that's not just a nationwide, it's becoming a worldwide problem. So that was one thing to be very proud of. And the fact that here in the nation's heartland, right in the middle of the country, we became an important orchestra in particular for our promotion of the music of this country. And I'm not saying that from a patriotic or nationalistic point of view. Just I loved what this country produced, the variety, all the wonderful kinds of music sounds. So we would combine pop stuff and jazz stuff and blues stuff and classical stuff. And then we would record it and we'd take it on tour and take it to New York, take it to Europe. We became great spokespersons for what was going on here. And the other thing I guess is I 
believe we kept a pretty high level of orchestral quality going on for all my time here. I was able to hire some of the very best musicians in the world, and we had a, just a marvelous time together. I hated to leave, but after all that time, I would have been put into maintenance mode. And I'm not a maintenance person. I'm about trying to find new ideas. And I needed to go somewhere else to do it. And from here, the step was to Washington, D.C. Some of it worked. A lot of it didn't. Orchestras sound different, as you pointed out in the book. And I'm wondering about recordings. Let's say The Messiah. Mm -hmm. How would I notice the difference if I didn't know what it was between a recording of the St. Louis Symphony doing the Messiah and, say, the Chicago Symphony. You would have noticed it more uh, maybe 35, 40 years ago. Let me try to put it a slightly different way to make it a little easier to figure out. When you hear Yo-Yo Ma or Joshua Bell or Yu Jo Wang, any number of artists, you listen for the distinct personality they bring to their interpretations. And that's throughout all the repertoire. When Yo-Yo plays Bach and then shifts to Beethoven or to Edgar Mayer or to whatever he does, he still sounds like Yo-Yo. You always know it's him. Orchestras were that way, primarily because so many of the musicians came from other schools of thought that were similar to that orchestra. Cleveland, under George Sell, was famous for its clarity and its precision. Philadelphia, with Stokowski and Ormandy, was this huge, lush carpet of sound that the strings produced. Chicago, with Schulte, was the brass. And the way their focused clarity brought it to your attention. You always knew who was playing. Well, this has changed now. Part of it's due to the audition process. Part of it's due to maybe music directors who don't think about the sonic nature of their orchestra throughout the variety of repertoire there is. I got criticized a lot saying my Mozart or my Haydn didn't sound at all like it might have sounded during Mozart's time. I don't care. I know what it's supposed to sound like, what they think it is, but I want it to sound like the St. Louis Symphony is playing. I want you to know what that orchestra sounds like. You take into consideration the hall, the musicians, even the audience, and that's how you create a sound. It's a logo, as it were, in sound. What would you say the sonic quality is to the, to the amateur ear, if it was detectable, of the St. Louis Symphony during your time here? I would say we were a combination of that warm, rich sound that Philadelphia had, combined with a kind of ferocious nature of playing that you would have found often with a really good, solid Russian orchestra. And that came from my Hollywood upbringing because there were all these Russians who had emigrated there and I knew that kind of playing. But also, I think with us, we'd become all so close. When you spend 27 years with one orchestra, you, you really start to all think alike. You'd put a new piece of music in front of us, we could read it down two seconds, we had it down. We just knew what sound we were going to apply. And I, th I think it was remarkable. And uh, going back and listening to a few of the recordings we made, I was really so proud and so pleased with those musicians. Uh, and you can hear that on the recordings. There's a kind of love that exists with many of the recordings. I won't ask you the ridiculous question of what's your favorite piece of music, but... Oh, I, I have an answer. Oh, well, please. I don't have a particular favorite piece, but I have a favorite composer. My wife. I'm actually one of the few people that has an answer to that question. And she's not even here, so you're just you're saying that. <laughs> yeah, but I make sure she watches it. <laughs> <laughs> the question I was going to ask you as an alternative to that is, which piece would you be perfectly happy never having to conduct again? Oh, I've, in what will be my fourth book, one of the chapters is a whole group of lists. And one of the lists is pieces I will be thrilled not to have to do again. I'm not a music director anymore, so I don't have to do a lot. These are probably going to bother some people viewing because they are in many cases favorites, but they're pieces I just don't want to do again. Here we go. I'll give you a few of them. 1812 Overture. I do not need to do this piece again. I do not have a cannon pointed at my back, so that ends that. Bolero. Bolero is a great piece of orchestrational mastery, but the conductor does nothing 
other than control how loud it gets. You start in one tempo, no room really for much else. The Pachelbel Canon. I had to record this piece. I hate this piece. I really don't like it. Really? Yes, I can't stand I love it. it. It goes on and on doing the same thing. It's. Uh, uh, you know, I, I was just happy that none of my marriages had to use this as music. Maybe for divorces, it would be good. That might be nice. Carmina Burana. It's a favorite of a lot of people. It's used all the time and advertising and all that. It was the last piece I conducted before the pandemic hit. Uh, why? Maybe because in this list, all the pieces I'm talking about are ones that you put on a program when you need to sell tickets. And I think at almost age 77, I'd like to believe that maybe it's not the repertoire itself that I need to conduct. It's just doing what I choose to do and doing it as well as possible. Can I ask you a dumb question? Of course. So many classical pieces end something like this. da 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 in a chess, you know, you have names for opening gambits. Is there a name for that kind of an ending? Uh, not really. They're just... Maybe we should make one up. Uh, we Call should. It no, no, I don't think we'll do that. I think it's like when the film is over, it always says, or used to say, the end, or fa, or whatever it did. Uh, declamatory endings usually signal to the audience that the piece is over, but sometimes not. Sometimes there are false endings. Sometimes the endings are soft. We can even attach the name of some composers to our endings. For instance, there's one composer that almost always signs his name at the end. Sergei Rachmaninoff. It always sounds like that. And then there's the ending always with, with Johannes Brahms. It seems like they put their names on it. But these were tried and true methods of concluding a piece. It's all changed now. Sometimes it's really impossible to tell when a piece is over. Uh, I know there were times that I've done this, given the cutoff, nothing happens, I have to look around, I'll take the baton, I'll drop it onto the podium somewhere so people, it's done now, or I have to turn around and say, okay, you, you can applaud, or, or not. <laughs> uh, but you're right, we need to come up with a name for the ending. I, uh, I did a piece that was written as an encore work in which every cliche ending was put into the piece just to show how it can be done. And the composer would simply called the piece The Ends. <laughs> so maybe that's what it is. Well, unfortunately, we're at the end. Oh. But it's not a cliche. Sincerely, thank you very much, Leonard Slatkin, for being My with us. My great pleasure to be with you. All we know is that these problems are not going away. Some are inevitable, and most are accidental. Others come from unseen dangers, such as coronavirus. We cannot prepare for every eventuality. At best, we can exercise caution, but at the same time, we cannot compromise our artistic integrity. No one outside the industry sees music as a high-risk profession. But such are the times we live in. We are required to behave like others as we travel, attend public events, and go about our daily lives. But we always need to remember that because we are musicians, we are not like others. <laughs> <laughs>